Sorry, I'm testing my slides. Just a second. <laughs> It doesn't synchronize in the way I want. Why is it? Then show the next slides. Why is it? Can you just scroll instead of pressing enter? It looks there are some delay. Can you hear me? Yishen, you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you fine. It's pretty strange because that's not the slide I'm showing now. I don't know why. I think uh, you can also try to share your screen, full screen, instead of like just a particular window. That's true. Let's see what it works. Okay, let's uh, see. Oh, this is better. Okay. Okay, great. Maybe, th maybe this works. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me fine, Yixuan? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to, I hope you can see my screen. If, if any moment you cannot see the screen or it's not synchronized, let me know, in, interrupt me and in post on chat. Welcome everyone, welcome to Harvard University, CMSA, Center for Mathematical Sciences and Applications, Quantum Matter in Math and Physics seminar series. Today, we are very honored to have uh, uh, Yin Xuan Lin. Uh, he is moving from Caltech to, uh, back to Harvard. He'll be speaking about exotic consistent one plus one D anomalies, a ghost story. And let me say a few words about him. Uh, Yin Xuan is, uh, was born in Taiwan, if I, I was correct. I hope so. And yeah. before high school, he was in Taiwan. And he studied at the MIT for his bachelor's degree. And then he uh, studied uh, his uh, uh, PhD under uh, Xi'in at Harvard. And then he moved to Caltech. And now he moved back to Harvard. Okay, I hope this question is correct. Correct me anything if I was wrong. And uh, you can find his research, for example, at uh, like uh, Slack, Inspire. These are the topics he's interested. Uh, moreover, uh, I would like to say a few words and so that you can understand him better and also his background. Uh, I would say first is that uh, the introduction may not be conventional, so, so you may not like it. If you don't want to hear something unconventional, then please uh, go away for five minutes and take your tea or coffee and come back. But I would like to justify who might be interested to hear more. Uh, zero's, zero's assumption is that I, I suppose Murray Gilman maybe do the same thing is interesting languages and uh, there's something one can understand better by each other. Uh, and the first thing is that actually some attendees last time asked me to explain more today. So I think uh, I've got some positive feedback. I will try to explain something about the names. 
The second one is actually uh, related to the question Nati Cyber asked me several times at IS, and I'm not sure he's here today, but I think today is, I, I can use five minutes to explain uh, better about the, 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 the Chinese names. And third is actually it's a, more or less like a mathematical and logical games. So if I write these names down and uh, try to pronounce them and order them in some proper way, you'll find some interesting uh, pattern. It's like a mathematical logic games, just like what we always like to do. And fourth is more important is that we are trying to introduce our speaker properly. And uh, I'll explain only once to clearly today, hopefully, and I will not explain any time more in the future. So, and also I think Yinxuan is saying that his talk may not consist of 90 minutes. So I think we'll spend five minutes to do the to those things. And uh, last time I think uh, I introduced the speaker, last time speaker is uh, Kong Linxin. And I mentioned their name, including the Cantonese name, a Mandarin name. A lot of Chinese people doesn't have a Cantonese name because they live in the mainland. However, we can fill in as I did. And today we would like to do a bit more. Uh, including some of physicists and mathematicians you may not be, you may be familiar and also many of them have attended our uh, talks, given talks in the past. And I think uh, right now it's a good comparison and all the names are listed in the order. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, uh, I'll path my way to introduce our speaker today, but before then I'll say a few words uh, from our uh, CMSA uh, professor uh, Yao. And, uh, Okay, so first of all, Yao is his last name, but in order to write a Chinese name, let me just actually, okay. The, 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 uh, la the last name will be the family name put in the front. His Cantonese name will be uh, pronounced as the following. If you use the music tone, it will be like so do do, so something like this. And pronounce the Cantonese will be like Yao Xin Tong. Well, the familiar Chinese name will be Chou Chen Tong. If I try to write more, one more is the Taiwanese name will be uh, Qiu Xing Dang. And you will see uh, all of these are very different. Yao Xing Tong, Chou Chen Tong, Qiu Xing Dang. And another uh, professor you may also know at the Harvard, uh, his name is uh, Yao Hongzhe. But that's uh, actually a, a Mandarin way of writing the Yao. So the, the, although the English spelling of the Chou Chen Tong, uh, Chou Lao Si Yao, Yao, Yao Xing Tong, and the Yao Hongzhe share the same English uh, last name, but actually they do, they do not really have the same uh, surname. And his Cantonese name will be uh, Yu Hongzha, or this Do Do Mi, Yu Hongzha. And the Mandarin will be uh, Yao Hongzhe, and Taiwanese name will be Yao Hongdi. And last time we introduced the speaker, uh, uh, Kong Linxin, uh, Janet. And his Cantonese name will be something like this. Uh, so there is some kind of uh, glissando. It's like a, a smoothing the sound from F to G to pronounce this first, uh, the, 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 his family, her family name, uh, Hong, Hong. So it's also Mi So, it's like Hong Lin Yan. And Mandarin name will be Kong Lin Xin. Taiwanese name will be Kong Lin Him. Kong Lin Him. And another physicist you might know, uh, Kong Liang. And his Cantonese name, if there is one, his will be Hong Fan Long. Faso Do Do. Well, his Taiwanese name will be uh, Kong Huan Liang. Uh, and the uh, physicist uh, Xiao Gang, Wen Xiao Gang, uh, his Cantonese name will be like this. So it's like Man Shou Gong. Well, his Cantonese, uh, well, his Taiwanese, uh, Mandarin name will be Wen Xiao Gang. His Taiwanese name will be uh, Bun Xiu Gong. Well, Lin Yixuan will be uh, his Mandarin name. While his Cantonese will be Lang Wen Sun. While his Taiwanese name will be Lin Yin Xuan. And we also had a speaker last time, uh, Hao Da, Lin Hao Da. His Cantonese name will be Lan Hao Da. While his Taiwanese name will be Lin Hao Da. So it's funny that uh, some language maybe we are used to like the the English uh, spelling may not be properly uh, labeled some of the Chinese name. So we, we may also ask whether this can happen to uh, uh, what we have in, in our language of describe nature. I think I wouldn't spend more time other than just introduce our speaker again. Uh, his name will be uh, Lin Yinxuan, 
Lin Wen, Lan Moon Son, or Lin Yingxuan. And uh, there are some more information you can check online about pronouncing those names. And I would like to advertise one more thing about Yingxuan is that uh, uh, for people who may learn this uh, uh, more uh, kind of uh, language evolving some kind of music tones may have a better years. And it's possible that it will be uh, good for intellectual stimulations. And as uh, Yingxuan was one of the proud uh, Taiwanese IPHO team that was in the private school, if I remember correctly, and got a gold medal. So that's a proof that if you want to learn one more language, that's actually a good language to choose. And uh, for the Mandarin, there's only four tones. So for street culture, there's a possibility you will pronounce the correct name, by like one over 64. If you have a Taiwanese name, you'll be one over eight to the power cube. So the, the chance you pronounce it correctly with all the right tones will be very few, while Cantonese will be even further. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me just uh, uh, introduce Yingxuan and uh, uh, please take over on this exotic, consistent one plus one D anomaly and ghost story. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Juven. Uh, it's it's the first time I heard my name translated to Cantonese. So. Um, Actually, about um, you said that Taiwanese has eight intonations, well, eight tones. I think um, in uh, in Minanhua original Minanhua, it, it there are eight tones, but I think we lost one when 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 it came to Taiwan, um, if I remember correctly. Okay, so um, uh, thanks, Juven, for the introduction, and I'm I'm afraid that. Um, my talk will not be as entertaining as Juven's uh, language lesson, but that's a, that's a very high bar to beat. Um, okay, so uh, let me share my slides. Can you see my, uh, my pointer? Yes. Okay. Um, so my title today is uh, Exotic Consistent 1 Plus 1D Anomalies, A Ghost Story. And um, so I, I just recently moved from Caltech to Harvard. Um, and this is, uh, I'm excited to be back to Harvard. And this is work done with uh, Qingming Zhang at uh, the Yao Center in Tsinghua. So the, the study of anomalies has a very long history. And one of the very important uh, milestones is the formulation of the Wazumino consistency condition in 1971. Um, based on this condition and together with some um, expected local properties of anomalies, this led to the development of the descent equations and a cohomological classification of perturbative anomalies. So um, for the descent equations, I think it's customary to um, cite the lectures, the series of lectures by Stora and Zumino. Um, sometimes it's called the Stora-Zumino descent equations. Um, but of course, there are many other important contributions um, along those lines. Um, and then uh, for the, this traditional list approach to anomalies, um, a more recent lecture uh, was given by, uh, by Harvey um, in 2003. So that's a, that'd be a useful reference. So here's a screenshot of the uh, famous paper by Wes and Zumino. Um, but now we, think of anomalies in a slightly from a slightly different perspective. So um, people start to find examples where anomalies can cancel between uh, theories in different dimensions. And the example started build up and eventually it became some a kind of a paradigm. So um, now we often say that think of anomaly in D dimensions as being the inflow of a classical action in one higher dimension. Based on this paradigm, um, we can ask, um, can we, so instead of think, instead of classifying anomalies in D dimensions, can we just try to classify um, 
the bulk theory um, using inflow. So um, this, at least so far, is in, inadequate for certain types of anomalies. For example, conformal anomalies. Uh, I don't, yeah, so, so far it's in that inadequate. But um, often it's expected to be okay um, for two anomalies. And a very important paper um, uh, by, by Wynn in 2013 um, sort of lays down uh, this goal to classify um, anomalies by classifying the bulk theory. Okay, so here is uh, another list of some important developments in this classification program. So there's a series of papers that um, uh, try to classify SPTs by group cohomology. Um, and then there's some work uh, that uh, a more complete classification um, by cobordism groups. And some of the results um, assumes the reflection positivity of the bulk theory. And then there are some, uh, of course, some, a lot of other very important uh, papers, but um, so I uh, list them here. Okay, so, um, so we just said that the inflow uh, probably doesn't work for conformal anomalies, but it is expected to work for two anomalies. So we'll be just thinking about two anomalies today. And um, the notation, okay, so here's how uh, we will think about two anomalies. Um, so first, a bit of notation. I will denote by phi, uh, I will denote collectively um, all of the background uh, metric or gauge fields um, that is appropriate for the symmetry of the theory. And lambda will denote all the background diffeomorphism and gauge transformations uh, for these background fields. Uh, the way, a way to think about two anomalies is to um, consider the partition function and uh, study how it transforms under background uh, gauge transformations or diffeomorphism. So if there's an anomaly, if there's a tooth in a tooth anomaly, then the partition function transforms with an anomalous phase, this alpha here, um, that can depend on both the background and the transformation you're performing. Okay, so that's sort of the general way we think about two anomalies. Today we will uh, focus on one plus one D, um, and um, I will assume. So I will only be thinking about theories where the partition functions are scalars, not vectors. Um, so. In particular, I don't require, so to def define my QFT, I don't require um, extra structure aside from just being, the background being some Riemannian geometry. I guess the way to say it is, um, it's a non-spin or bosonic theory. But the, the important thing is that the partition function, the partition function is a scalar. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, yes. Sorry, I have a question. Is that uh, do you distinguish uh, the uh, this gauge anomaly from a gravitational anomaly? Uh, looks like a conformal anomaly belong to this gravitational anomaly, and uh, the tooth anomaly is like a gauge anomaly. Whether these two are different? Um, right. So I'm I'm only talking about so the for gravitational anomaly, I will only be thinking about the ones that will be that are invariant under RG flows. So for example, for a conformal anomaly, um, you have you know, the left and right central charges, um, yeah. but I will only be thinking about their difference or the so-called chiral central charge. Okay, yes. So that's, a, that's belong to gravitational anomaly, do not yes. belong to gauge anomaly or the anomaly. That's a, that's a distinction. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. Okay, so, um, Okay, so first, um, for a very for a general theory, um, we we can inf well we can couple the one plus one d theory to a two plus one d Chern Simons action, and if you couple it to this uh, this gravitational Chern Simons action shown here, then you can cancel the 
gravitational anomaly in 1 plus 1d. And um, if your theory has, say, a U1 global symmetry, then you can consider this other Chern Simons, this U1 Chern Simons action. And you can, again, inflow, you can cancel the U1 anomaly in 1 plus 1d. And it is uh, well known, um, I guess, by the work of Witten, that for the Chern Simons actions to be well defined in the bulk, um, the levels have to be quantized. And so, previous slide. Okay, so here the Chern Simons level, in order to cancel the anomaly, the Chern Simons level has to be tuned to the anomaly coefficient in 1 plus 1d. So, the quantization of the Chern Simons level translates to the quantization of anomaly coefficients in 1 plus 1d. And if we think about CFT, um, okay, because the normalization of kappa, there are different conventions, but usually we have a fixed convention for the central charge and the levels. So it's easier to um, state it in CFT terms. So the quantization um, by Chern Simons, by the Chern Simons level, leads to the statement that C left minus C right is a multiple of eight. And uh, the left level minus the right level is an even integer. Okay, so, um, so here's the ghost story part. So let's think about one of the, uh, the most, the simplest uh, free, free CFTs that we know, um, a holomorphic BC ghost system. Um, this is in Pachinsky chapter two and three. Uh, so here's the action. What we have are just two uh, anti-commuting free fields, B and C. And they have conformal weights, uh, lambda and one minus lambda. And lambda is some, uh, some, sorry, some number you can choose. The, uh, so there is, there is a U1 symmetry that rotates B and C by opposite phases. This is usually called the ghost number symmetry. And the convention is usually to assign uh, B to have negative one charge, and C to have uh, a plus one charge. And here I write down the explicit ex expressions for the stress tensor and this U1 current. And you can use these expressions together with width contraction to compute the, uh, the central charge and the level. Uh, in, in, so in the beginning, you, you said we are only going to talk about non-spin theory. Yeah. Theory. Well, maybe that's why you are going to mention. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I should. Yeah, that, right. Okay. <laughs> Go on. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, the BC system can be defined. Well, at least you can write it, write down like the action or uh, the data shown on the previous si slide for any lambda. Sorry, here for any lambda. Um, but um, so today we only want to think about um, non-spin theory. So um, we will restrict to lambda being an integer. In this case, the theory can be defined on an arbitrary uh, Riemann surface. You don't need any additional structure. With this quantization of lambda, the central charge given by this formula is, um, is well, a multiple of 24 minus 2. So it's minus 2 mod 24. And the level, you can also compute it. it level is 1. The k minus k bar is 1. So we see. This is incompatible with um, the previously stated uh, quantization of the Chern Simons levels. And just to remind you, um, there we said that the C, C left minus C right has to be a multiple of eight. Here it's not a multiple of eight. And we said that the level, the K minus K bar must be an even integer, but here it's just one. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yes. a question. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, chiral central charge as a multiple of eight, since it already violates the many uh, quantum Hall system, you know, they are not multiple of eight. They can even be fraction number. But in general, they are quantized as a rational number uh, rather than a real number. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, uh, let me I try, I try to understand uh, whether that will fit 
this consideration. So this quantization for multiple eight is uh, in generally not true uh, for, for many examples for a 2D uh, theory. So in those examples, um, is there a topological order or do they exist even without topological order? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a uh, there is a non invertible uh, topological order. So, uh, so, so here hmm. you consider all the all the invertible one or the one with no quasi particle. Is that the consideration here? Yes, I'm only considering invertible. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm free. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Ming has a. Yeah. Excuse me. So uh, I probably missed that on the slide, but what? What happens if lambda is not integer? What kind of structure you need to define a theory? So for example, if lambda is a half integer, then uh, B and C would be, um, would be, would have spin. So oh, you would need a spin structure. So lambda is not an arbitrary number, just integer or half integer. Um, well, if it's some arbitrary number, you can still write these down, but if you want to defend, define it on like a general curve manifold, um, you probably need some extra structure, but I don't know what structure you need. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thanks for the questions. Okay, so, um, so now that we've seen sort of given a, an overview or a re review of anomaly inflow and seen the example of the holomorphic BC system, the goal of today is um, first we want to so inflow is very nice, but we want to see if there is a purely one plus one D way of classifying two phenomenas. And in particular, we want to see that, we want to see whether the, um, the anomalies of the holomorphic BC GO system uh, fits into this classification. And then um, I haven't motivated the second part, but um, the, the, BC GO system, the ghost number symmetry has a very famous mixed gravitational anomaly. So we will examine that. We will formulate that in, um, actually we will use descent to uh, formulate this anomaly. And at the end, I will relate this mixed gravitational anomaly to uh, what is called an isotopy anomaly for the U1 topological defects. And there we'll have some interest, interesting things to say. Okay, part one, um, so pure anomalies. Let us go back to our traditional roots and study the Wesumino consistency condition. So in order to obtain um, any kind of quantization on the anomaly coefficients, it's, it's not enough to consider just perturbative anomalies. We need to consider, we need to include large gauge transformations. And the appropriate condition that generalizes the Wesumino consistency condition for um, perturbative anomalies is the following. It's, it's very natural. So uh, again, the anomalous phase, uh, so under background gauge transformations, there, the partition function acquires an anomalous phase. And the statement of this consistency is that this diagram on the right uh, commutes up to phases of two pi. Um, two pi is, is okay because uh, it's exponentiated here. So first, so start with a partition function on some background. Um, if we go the bottom route, what we do is a single transformation of lambda two times lambda one. So you get here and you acquire an anomalous phase that's given by the first term here. If we go the top route, then in the first step, we do one transformation with respect to uh, lambda one, you get one anomalous phase, that's this term. But now your background is, tra is, is transformed. So phi is not equal to, well, generally not equal to phi uh, uh, superscript lambda one. This is already acted on by lambda one. But now we do a second step. So we perform a lambda two transformation and we acquire a, another anomalous phase here. So the statement is that, uh, so for this diagram to commute uh, up to two pi, um, this has to be, so this is just the, what I just said in the equations. 
And if you restrict to infinitesimal or perturbative lambda, then this condition will give you back the uh, original Wezumino for uh, perturbative anomalies. Um, and uh, I find this book uh, by Ascaraga Izquierdo um, quite useful. A, a second important property of um, anomalies is that of locality. So the words people usually say on this point is that um, anomalies should be a short distance effect or anomalies should originate in the UV. And that uh, presents some local property for anomalies. To state it a little more precisely, what we want is that the anomalous phase is a local functional of the background, the background fields, phi. And moreover, if this lambda is infinitesimal, then it's a local functional of both phi and lambda. And we also want it to vanish in the trivial background. Um, a way to argue this, uh, for, so for infinitesimal lambda, a way to argue that this should be true is the following. So um, consider a continuous symmetry. We know that um, even if you have anomalies, the, the conservation, the divergence of the Noether current J um, should that, well, this divergence should vanish up to contact terms in correlation functions. Uh, I should have drawn a correlation function here, but um, you get the idea. If the, if locality were false, then using, uh, you can use the anomalous ward identities to derive what this divergence of J should be. And you will see that it will violate this structure. It will violate this contact structure. So from this, um, it's quite natural, uh, it's quite natural to, um, expect local, uh, this local property of the anomalous phase. OK, so um, now we will use the consistency and locality to study um, the pure gravitational, so, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, one more slide, one more slide about locality. So the lo local property I just stated um, can be made even, even more precisely as follows. Um, so curly G, I'll let curly G denote the space of all background gauge or diffeomorphism transformations. In general, this space is broken up into different connected components because of the existence of large transformations. Um, so I will label them by the subscript N and in, par in particular, G sub zero is the connected component that contains the trivial transformation. Um, next, we need a basis of local functionals that vanish in the trivial background. So I'm going to denote it by a curly A sub I here. Um, from the local properties I stated in the previous slide, the anomalous phase has to take this form. So, um, right, so, so theta depend, just depends on the connected component. And then for, for every uh, independent local functional, um, uh, you can also dress it with a function of the connected component you're in. Okay, sorry. So this is uh, a bit of a mouthful, but um, now let us try to use consistency and locality to constrain uh, pure gravitational and pure U1 anomalies. Okay. So we will consider a, so for simplicity, we'll consider a CFT on a flat torus and we will study its transformation under, uh, it's the anomalous, the anomaly under modular transformations. Suppose the partition function, suppose the torus partition function does not vanish identically for all torus moduli tau. By locality and while symmetry, um, the anomalous phase cannot depend on tau. So for example, one can try to, one can, for example, uh, uh, write down, um, say a volume, a volume form, like integral of uh, root G, but that term is not uh, invariant under vial symmetry. So um, one can uh, argue that it's, it's actually inconsistent. 
So the upshot is that um, under the modular transformation, the anomalous phase can only depend on the element of, uh, well, the particular transformation you perform and not on the background and not on the complex moduli tau. So one immediately realizes that the finite Wesumino condition is nothing but a one co-cycle condition. And the fact that the fact that this anomalous phase has no tau dependence means that the coefficient is just u1. It's very simple. So solutions to the finite Wesumino consistency condition is equivalent to computing the group cohomology, the first group cohomology of PSL2Z in the coefficient u1. Um, here it's PSL2Z instead of SL2Z because we're just considering a torus with no insertions. So S square acts trivially. And um, the, this group, this cohomology group is isomorphic to Z6. Okay, uh, let me try to describe um, what the anomalous phases are uh, uh, more concretely. So um, because of the group structure, the general anomalous phase under an SL2Z transformation is, is, purely de is solely determined by the uh, anomalous phase under S and T. The generator of this Z6 um, can be described as follows. It, it flips the sign of Z under S. So theta S is pi. So it flips the sign of Z. And um, under T, it transformed by a phase that's the sixth root of unity. So theta T is pi over three. And um, we all know that there's a relation between the, uh, well, how the partition function transforms under T and the, chi the uh, chiral central charge, the, uh, which captures the gravitational anomaly. So using this relation, it is easy to see that um, the generative Z6 has C minus uh, equal to minus four mod 24. And for any odd element of, of Z6, so you take that generator, you raise it to some odd power. Under an S transformation, you always get a minus sign. And so the, the odd elements are described by having this, the chiral central charge not a multiple of eight, but rather eight Z plus four. The fact that under an S transform, um, you've, uh, the partition function flips sign means it's means that the theory is actually non-unitary. So it's easy, uh, one can see this by considering the S invariant point, uh, tau equals I. This configuration is, is reflection symmetric. So if your theory is unitary or reflection positive, then Z would have to be positive. But the fact that, the fact that you get a minus sign uh, here implies that it has to vanish. So, so we conclude that unitarity implies that C, that, that the chiral central charge actually has to be a multiple of eight. Um, okay, so, so far, so this condition is still incompatible with the ghost. So why? That is because we, we know that for the ghost system, we have anti-commuting fields. And on the flat torus, there's a zero mode. Well, there are zero modes that make the partition function vanish. So what can we say in, in, those, in that case? What if the partition function vanishes identically for all tau? What we can do is we can consider the torus one point function. Now, because there's an insertion, um, the, the, we have to consider slightly, uh, well, the group cohomology that's relevant here is SL2Z, again, in coefficients of U1 um, for locality reasons that I explained. Um, now, the group cohomology, the, the first group cohomology is isomorphic to Z12. So by uh, a very similar um, exercise, uh, as in the previous slides, um, one would conclude that if at least 
a single torus partition function does not vanish identically, then the chiral central charge is an even integer. So previously it was z6. We concluded that c is a multiple of 4. Now it's z12. So c is an even integer. And now we see that this, uh, this, this is consistent with the holomorphic BC system. Okay, um, are there any questions at this point? Okay, now let's consider the pure U1 anomaly. Again, we will put the CFT on a flat torus and um, I'm going to normalize the uh, periodicity by two pi. So, sorry, Ying, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so you said the group cohomology was uh, for the SL2Z case is relevant for your discussion. Uh, does that also rely on the particular choice of the operator that you insert on the torus? Yeah, yes, yes. So you have to choose one that has definite conformal weight. Okay. It doesn't have to be primary actually, but it has to, be, it has to have definite conformal weight. Okay, but it doesn't have to be a zero mode. Uh, well, you have to make it non. You have to make it not vanish. So the statement is just that as long as you can uh, do that, um, you can make it non vanish. You, then right, but you can make it not vanish just by inserting the zero mode. Uh, yes. But you yeah, say so that your statement does not rely on whether it's the zero mode or not. Well, my statement relies on it non-vanishing. So in the specific mm -hmm. case of the BC system, you can say, oh, you insert a zero mode, but mm -hmm. I can imagine more generally, like just some abstract theory, as long as some torus one point function does not vanish, then you can reach the same conclusion. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so back to U1 anomaly. Uh, so on the, on the torus, the space of U1 transformations has many connected components because now the U1, so the transformation can have winding around the non-contractible cycles. Uh, so the A cycle and B cycles. And a way to detect the winding is simply to integrate your gauge transformation, your gauge parameter along the non-contractible cycle. And right, so this will give you the winding number. And the different components are labeled by, so on a torus you have A and B, so the, the components are labeled by MA and MB. Um, by locality, um, uh, one can try to write down what the general form of the, of the anomalous phase is, and we end up with this form. So you see there's this, there's a familiar piece, which is D lambda A. But if you want to include large U1 transformations, then um, you can, in general, dress it by some function that depends on the winding, depends on the connected component of the uh, U1 transformation you perform. Um, there are some more general things you can write down. And in particular, there's this whole freedom of um, periodic functions that you can insert here. Um, but um, we will actually restrict to uh, flat gauge orbits and set up to zero so that we don't have to worry about all the complication here. So we don't have to worry about kappa prime. And we will study the uh, consistency, the Wesumino consistency for the first term and this last term theta, which is a general function of the uh, connected component of the transformation. So here's the finite Wesumino uh, diagram again. And in blue, we do one transformation that's lambda 2 lambda 1 at once. Here is the phase you get. Um, and in uh, yellow is this transformation by lambda 1. This is the anomalous phase you get. And then the red is the second step. This is the phase you get. So let's not bother with the details. After a bit of man manipulation, you can write it in this form. And okay, so first of all, um, so omega here, I haven't told you what it is. It's the intersection matrix uh, for the, so say we picked A cycle, B cycle, then um, it's an off diagonal matrix with you know, one minus one. It's the intersection matrix. And 
the way that it appeared is that it comes from this, uh, this red transformation. So in the first step, we uh, transform phi by lambda one. So in this new background, there's a piece of A that, uh, that goes like integral of the lambda one. Now, when you do a second transformation, um, you, uh, you mix d lambda one with d lambda two. So you get an integral over uh, d lambda one, d lambda two, that is nothing but uh, the, uh, so you introduce the pairing between the two winding numbers um, and there's an intersection matrix in the, in the middle. Now, uh, okay, let's look at this equation here. If you look at the second and third lines, you see that the whole thing is proportional to integral over d lambda one, integral over d lambda two. But um, we haven't really chosen, so a and lambda one and lambda two, they're arbitrary. So for this, for this to be consistent, um, the coefficients must actually vanish. And one immediately concludes that um, this kappa, which just by locality could have been a function of the connected component of the transformation. So a function of the winding is actually independent of the, the winding. So it is a constant and um, it is nothing but the but kappa F squared, which is the, the usual perturbative, uh, the usual anomaly coefficient for the perturbative U1 anomaly. Um, I, let's see what time is it? Okay, so I um, let me not bore you with uh, the the details, but after we after we eliminated the second and third lines, um, we are left with one equation, and one can try to solve it. This is the solution, and in particular, one finds that um, kappa f squared is quantized as integers, not even integers, and this is uh, so. Just a comment. Had we not included this theta uh, possibility in there, um, one would, if you do this exercise without this theta, theta term, then um, one would conclude that kappa is an even integer. But because we, we considered a more general ansatz, um, we had a solution that, um, we had solutions that could accommodate integer, general integer kappa. Uh, yes. Another 40 minutes, so take your time. Okay, thanks. Okay, to summarize what we've learned about um, perturbative, sorry, uh, pure anomalies. Um, so first, the quantization of anomaly coefficients from the bulk chain simons action told us that the gravitational one is a multiple of eight and the U1 anomaly coefficient is an even integer. From our analysis of the finite Wesumino condition, we found something weaker. We found a weaker quantization condition, which is that um, instead of multiple of eight, it just happened to be an even integer. And for U1, instead of even integer, it just has to be an integer. And the quantization condition we got from finite Wesumino is actually saturated by the holomorphic BC system. So, and actually you can, uh, explicitly compute the torus partition function of the BC system with a background uh, gauge field turned on, and you can explicitly verify the anomalous phases. Um, we also concluded using modular, uh, well, using the, by studying the partition function at the S invariant point, that if kappa is not, sorry, if, right, so if the chiral central charge is not a multiple of eight, then the theory must be non-unitary. So if you assume unitarity, then the classification we got is actually consistent with the um, quantization by the bulk chain simons action. Okay, so I think this concludes, yeah, this concludes part one about pure anomalies. Um, are there questions before we move on? Uh, yeah, I have a question. And this is perhaps related to Xiaogang's comments in the chat. So for the more general, non-unitary anomalies that you have in the second equation, do you have an inflow mechanism for them? Namely, do you know what would be the bulk invertible topological order? 
that. Uh, sorry, for the second, you mean the U1? Oh, sorry, I mean the second line for those two kinds of phenomena. Um, I don't know. Um, like a cheap way is maybe one can, I don't know, maybe one can argue that the quantization of the bulk transignments level can somehow be relaxed. Or for the U1, you can maybe argue that um, what we thought was the periodicity of U1 is not the true periodicity. Maybe, I don't know, you can define a, a lift of U1 um, that's say double the periodicity. In that case, you will multiply um, kappa F squared by a, a factor of four, and then it's an even integer, and then you can inflow. But I don't know what the correct way to, to, to think about it is in the, in the inflow, uh, from the inflow perspective. These, these are just some possibilities. Yeah, here, uh, just to say that uh, actually in the box, because, uh, you can construct exact flow model, which is on unitary. You just uh -huh. do some kind of tensor. This is a real, real solution. How many non-unitary solution? I wonder, maybe that's maybe one direction. Yeah, that's and, what I'm uh, asking for. Another thing I'd like to, can you explain a little more uh, this unitary condition and uh, this S transformation? Uh, why this? Uh -huh. uh, because S usually we say this uh, S transformation is part of the modular group. Usually the unitary is fine. But uh, you say the sign, even minus sign can kill. Minus sign is allowed by unitarity as a unitary representation, you know. And uh, so, so, oh. so why, why this uh, uh, modular transformation gave you minus sign imply non unitarity? Uh, maybe can you explain a little bit along this direction? So maybe this is a difference between unitarity of the representation versus unitarity of the quantum field theory. Yeah. So, right. So here, what I'm saying here is, um, so at tau equals i, it's a square torus. It's yeah. a square torus with no insertion. So it's easy to draw a line where, where it's a reflection symmetric. The torus is reflection symmetric. And if a quantum field theory is unitary or reflection positive in um, Euclidean signature, then this quantum, this partition function would have to be positive. That's, I guess that's that's one that's like the definition of a uh, of a unitary quantum field theory. Okay, let, so there's a really the question. Usually, you can view S transformation as a ninety degree rotation, and uh, so here you view them as a reflection or something. That's a. Um. Um. That's true, um, but um, here when I say it's reflection, yeah, so the square torus has a lot of symmetries, right? It's rotationally oh, yeah. symmetric, but it's also, you can also reflect, it's also reflection symmetric. Yeah. So by considering this very symmetric configuration, it's true that when you rotate it, you get a minus sign, but um, it's also reflection symmetric. So um, when, I, when I try to argue it's non-unitary, I'm using the reflection symmetry, not the rotation symmetry. I see. So, so maybe let me for me more general sense. So actually the, the mapping class group here, you include this uh, reflection uh, of a uh, space time. Um, and that part may have some constraints. Sorry, so If a I mapping class group only contain orientation preserving map, uh, mm -hmm. can you detect uh, uh, reflection positivity? Or you need to include this uh, reflection of space time to detect this uh, reflection positivity. That's a question. So I think I did not include reflection in my mapping class group. And okay. all I need, all I needed was, um, so all I needed was that Z uh, minus one over tau is minus Z of tau. I and, then, and then I just set tau to I. Okay, okay. From that equation, I, from that equation, I conclude this is zero. I see. And then I start my second, like a, se a separate line of argument. I say this configuration is also symmetric under reflection. So by the, I guess the axioms or definition of a, of a unitary quantum field theory, this would have to be positive, but it's not. So, so it's non-unitary. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for the question. Okay, so let's move on to part two.
So part two is about the uh, a mixed uh, mixed U1 gravitational anomaly. So let's go back to our ghost story. So if we consider the uh, holomorphic DC ghosts, the U1 ghost number symmetry has a famous mixed gravitational anomaly. Um, if you want to describe it by anomalous conservation, then what we're saying is that the divergence of the, the current J has a piece that is proportional to the, the, um, the curvature, sorry, the, the Ricci scalar. And um, if you want to think about, uh, so if you, if you want to think about this in terms of uh, OPE in the CFD data, then what this, this is telling you is that T and J has a non-trivial two-point function. So in the TJ OPE, there's a, there's a piece that goes like a constant uh, divided by Z cubed. In the specific case of the BC system, this coefficient is given in terms of lambda as follows. So it's one minus two lambda over four. And as we said before, we're assuming, we're taking lambda to be integer. Um, so what we see is that kappa is, uh, is some multiple of uh, a quarter for the holomorphic BC ghosts. And um, if you, so if you, if you take the anomalous conservation equation and you just integrate it, you will conclude that on a general Riemann surface, this U1, it's, it's almost conserved, but it's conserved up to a background charge. And because of the mixed gravitational anomaly, this background charge is proportional to the Euler characteristic of the Riemann surface. So I just wrote it in, um, so this is just in formula. And uh, this is a very well-known thing in string theory. You can read about in Pochinsky chapter five. Okay, so now let, let us try to describe this anomaly um, in more general terms, not just for the, for the BC system. So let's go to the very uh, traditional descent, um, descent, descent procedure. Um, so yeah, so the descent is a way to solve the Wesley amino consistency condition. And um, let me first say that there's some literature that actually states that this anomaly has no descent. Um, we will see why. Let me just write down for you the uh, anomaly four form, the anomaly poly polynomial four form. It is very naturally given by um, F wedge uh, R. So F is for the U1 symmetry. R is the Ricci tensor. And to contract the indices, I have to, so I have to contract the, these free uh, indices by an epsilon tensor. And from this, you can derive, just by the usual descent, you can write down the descent three form, and it looks like this. Um, there's, a, there's a detail here that I don't want to go into. There's, a, there's, an, ambig there's an ambiguity um, due to the freedom of adding a Bardeen counter term. Um, that's this term, but that's not important for us. So normally, it's very, it's very useful to write down, to, uh, write down the descent three form because it usually has um, the same form as the uh, bulk classical, uh, sorry, bulk classical action that gives the inflow. But here's a problem: when we wrote down, when we write down the anomaly polynomial and also the descent three form, we had to use this epsilon tensor to contract with the Ricci scale, the, the Ricci tensor. But the epsilon tensor, although it is an invariant symbol in one plus one d. It is not in two plus one D. So um, if, you, if you write this, if you regard this as a two plus one D classical action, um, it, it, you're, you're using a symbol that, that breaks Lorentz symmetry. So it's not very natural. Right, so the, the naive classical action you read off from the descent three form breaks two, uh, two plus one D Lorentz invariance. And this is the, I think this is the reason why um, some people say that there is no descent or inflow for this mixed gravitational anomaly. 
So we have a proposal. Instead of matching the one plus one D spin connection with a two plus one D spin connection. So this is what uh, we usually do. For instance, in the, uh, for pure gravitational anomaly, this is what is done. But let's not do that. Instead, let us, let us match the one plus one D spin connection with an SO2 gauge field. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not sure if this is a good notation, but I'm just, I'm going to label it uh, with a subscript R. Um, R represents, um, I guess this is a gravitational. This is the SO2 frame rotation uh, in the one plus one D. So the two plus one D action that we propose is just a mixed uh, churn Simons action. So A is the uh, original U1, internal U1. And then this F is the field strength of this extra SO2 gauge field that we introduce. And um, in order to connect to the, the spin connection, the one plus one D spin connection, we match this uh, gauge field uh, at the boundary, at the, at the one plus one D boundary um, as follows. Um, so when Juven saw my abstract, he asked me like why I call this SO2 instead of U1. There isn't really a, a good reason. I just wanted to distinguish um, like the, the, the original internal U1 symmetry with another U1 that I introduced just to match with the, the frame rotation, the SO2 frame rotation. So I, I'm calling one SO2 and calling the other U1. There, there, yeah, this is U1, isomorphic to U1. Okay, now, um, if you believe in, okay, so if you, if, if we uh, treat this inflow seriously, then um, this mixed turn Simons action, it's, it's a mixed turn Simons action, also has quantized levels to be consistent. And the quantization is given by this. So kappa, the mixed anomaly coefficient is a multiple of a quarter, which um, is consistent with the holomorphic BC ghost. So here, sorry. Um, right, so uh, here what we're doing is quite sort of the opposite of part one. Part one, we said we wanted to um, um, even though there's inflow, let's try to derive something from a purely one plus one D perspective. But now I am quantizing this anomaly coefficient by inflow. So um, I, I might look like, well, a bit of a hypocrite, but um, the fact is, uh, so it might be possible to derive a quantization on this mixed anomaly, also by some consideration of finite Wazumino. But in order for this coefficient to appear, remember it, it multiplies f wedge uh, r in the anomaly polynomial. So for it to for this term to not vanish, you have to have non-vanishing r. So it is necessary to go beyond the flat torus. Um, so it makes the the problem a lot more complicated, and we we don't so far we don't know how to derive a quantization just based on that. Um, therefore, uh, the inflow quantization is is um, what we will um, accept, uh, at least for now. Now, in a general CFT, um, it doesn't have to be a holomorphic system. So you have a TJ OPE, you have a T bar J bar OPE. They each have some constant, some coefficient in the one over Z cube term. The anomaly coefficient kappa fr is related to the two. So it's related to the sum of, of the two. And then there's this extra factor. If kappa is not zero, okay, then it means either alpha is non-zero or alpha bar is non-zero or both. But in any case, one can conclude that either j or j bar is not a primary. This, is, this just follows from the uh, commutation relations that is given by the OPE. So if it's not a primary, if it's in a unitary theory, it, so if it's not a primary, then it should be a descendant of some other um, lower weight operator. But J is weight one. So what we're saying is that there exists a, a weight zero operator that is not the identity. So this is in tension with um, a unitary compact CFT. 
So if kappa is non-zero, the theory must be either non-unitary or non-compact. Um, okay, and any questions? Okay, now let me move on to the, the final part of this talk. So consider a general Riemann surface and consider a U1 symmetry defect um, that's wrapped along, along some curve C. Um, because we have a Noether current, we can very explicitly write down what this U1 symmetry defect is. So um, N here is the uh, normal vector to the curve C. J is the Noether current. And eta is, eta labels which uh, element of U1 um, it is. So uh, eta has periodicity one and it labels the U1 elements. Now we can ask uh, what happens when we deform the curve C to some other curve C prime. This deformation is going to swipe over some domain D, this uh, pink part that I, I drew in. Um, so now it's a simple exercise to, to see what happens. In fact, we will acquire an anomalous phase. So we take the definition of the, the defect line. That's the first line here. First, we just apply the divergence theorem. We turn this uh, line integral into a surface integral inside um, the difference between C and C prime. So this domain D. Next, um, now that we have a divergence of J, we can use the anomalous conservation equation. Um, and if there's a gravitational anomaly, it's going to be, there's going to be a piece that is proportional to um, the, Ricci, the Ricci scalar. Okay, so this is the anomalous phase if you, if you um, deform your defect. So this defect line, when we define it on flat space, it's a topological defect. It doesn't matter how you deform it. It's, it, doesn't it won't change the correlation function whatsoever. However, because of the mixed gravitational anomaly, when you define it on a curved surface, it is not really, it's not, not truly topological anymore. When you deform it, um, there is a, uh, an anomalous phase that is proportional to um, the integral over uh, root gr of sort of the domain you, you sweep over. And this is called the isotopy anomaly of a topological defect. Now, this anomaly can be eliminated by an appropriate improvement. What we do is, so we take the original line L, we multiply it by um, a term that is the line integral over the extrinsic curvature of the curve uh, of the curve C um, with appropriate coefficients. This defines for us a new, an improved line L tilde. And why does this help? Um, sorry, why does this help? The anomalous phase here um, by, the Gauss, by the gauss bonnet theorem, this, this integral will exactly cancel with the, uh, this extrinsic curvature um, piece. So after the improvement, um, there is no longer an anomalous phase when we deform the, the topological line. So now it's truly topological. However, there's, there's a cost. Um, after we improve, after we do the improvement, if you go back to flat space, you will see that um, by definition of our improved line, the periodicity is, uh, can be ruined. So if you start with uh, L eta, and then um, you, so you, you flow, well, you, you deform eta to, you continue eta to eta plus one, which should have been the periodicity, the anomalous phase um, sorry, not the anomalous phase, the phase you acquire from this extra improvement term is given by this factor, exponential four pi i kappa. And before we saw that, um, well, one way, well, inflow quantization shows you that the kappa um, is a multiple of a quarter. And in particular, this is realized in the holomorphic VC system. So it's very, it's, it, yeah, it's realized. 
But if kappa is uh, z over four plus a half, namely if kappa is not a multiple of um, a half, then this phase here does not evaluate to one, it evaluates to minus one. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that if you are given, um, if, the, if, the, uh, if the kappa is quantized to its smallest unit, then um, the periodicity of U1 defined by this improved line is not one, but two. There's an uplift. So, okay, the periodicity of U1, the uplifted U1 tilde defined by the improved defect is doubled. With respect to this improved, well, with respect to this lifted U1 tilde, the charges of the field are now even integers. The pure U1 tilde anomaly um, gets multiplied by a factor of four. So now it's, uh, it's a multiple of four and um, one can then do a uh, inflow by a turn Simon's action. So I guess the, the last and the second to last point look like pros, but this, uh, the quantization of charges is intention of how we usually quantize, how, how we usually determine the periodicity of U1. What, what we usually do is we say the, the charge lattice is, you normalize it such that the charge lattice run over all integers. But that's not what happens here. Um, so I'm not saying that U1 tilde is the correct U1. Um, I'm sort of presenting a dilemma here. You can go with U1, the original U1, which is perfectly fine on flat space. It just has an isotopy anomaly on the curve manifold. If you don't like the isotopy anomaly, you can consider this other U1 tilde. But the cost is that, um, yeah, the, the co it comes with some cost. The, uh, the, the weird feature here that we described, the, uh, the doubling of the periodicity. So just to conclude, uh, again, um, uh, by, by inflow of some churn simons action, um, the first line is the quantization of anomaly coefficients. By considering finite Wezumino, um, we saw that the pure gravitational and pure U1 anomaly coefficients um, quantization is weakened. Um, we don't know how to do that for the mixed gravitational anomaly so far. And then here is just to show you that the holomorphic BC ghost with, uh, say, lambda equals one, uh, saturates sort of the minimum anomaly, amount of anomaly that's, uh, that we derived. Um, so finally, let me say that this mixed gravitational anomaly has a higher dimensional generalization the anomalous phase is the, um, the U1 gauge parameter multiplied by the Euler form. So here's the Euler form. And one can, again, um, try to inflow it by some U1 times SOD mixed turn Simons action. Um, when, D was, when D is two, we wrote it as SO2. There is a, well, okay. So if we consider a, a bulk boundary system that is a product manifold. So MD is the, uh, the boundary. And then we just uh, product it with some with a half line and consider this inflow. Then, then you don't have to introduce you know, an, an extra gauge field. Well, you can, you can sort of do this ordinary inflow and write down this term here. But um, it's unclear how to generalize this to general manifolds, not of the product form. And in particular, I don't know how, from this inflow, how to quantize uh, kappa fr. So with that, I will conclude and um, ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Yijun. Uh, question from the audience, please feel free. Uh, yes, I have a, a, a maybe comment. Uh, this is mm. It looks like this mixed anomaly is related to, to the something like a, called a, a, a spin vector in quantum Hall state. Basically, that describes uh, in the quantum Hall state, when you put the quantum Hall state on the curved space, and uh, the, how much uh, charge is induced by the curvature. You know, the, mm -hmm. when they have a curvature, it induce some charge around the curvature. 
And this coefficient is called a spin vector. And usually a quantum Hall states have this kind of non-zero spin vector. So that looks like a relate to, to your, this mixed number is a kappa fr. So, mm -hmm. so kappa fr, whether it can be interpreted as a, or for every curvature, there is something charge current induced by the curvature. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. Okay, yeah, sorry. I have a actually related uh, comment. So uh, a natural place where the non-unitary PC system comes out uh, is to do a twist of a physical fermion system. So yes. you redefine your stress sensor by the, uh, the holomorphic derivative of the U1 conserved current. And yes. in that context, your mixed anomaly between the U1 symmetry of the PC system, system and gravity just comes from the usual total anomaly for the U1 symmetry of the fermion. Yes. So everything can be understood in more like um, uh, pedestrian language from that perspective. Yes. So so there are so you can construct other examples that have this mixed gravitational anomaly exactly by what you said by by topological twisting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This was pointed out um, in particular in, in Nakayama, and. I see. Um, yeah, but um, I guess you have to be careful. I mean, so for example, so in your example, you you take you take like three fermions and then you twist it to the to like a general BC system, right? That's right. Um, yeah, but like for example, three fermion, it's it's a spin CFT, not a non-spin CFT. Yes. Um, so I think topological twisting is a a way to construct theories with this mixed gravitational anomaly. I don't know how to argue that. I don't know if it's always the case that any theory with this anomaly can be topologically twisted to a conventional theory that does not have this anomaly. Yeah, the, 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 the Fermat having spin is not a problem, right? Precisely because you're doing the topological twisting. So they can be defined without referring to a yeah. spin structure, right? Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't mean that there's a problem. I'm just saying that um, in my talk, I'm studying anomalies of non-spin theories. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, but the, the topology, I mean, I think we agree that topological twist is precisely what implements uh, the, the way to define fermions on, on non spin manifolds. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so this paper by Nakayama in, in 18 discusses some aspects of that. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you talk about the higher dimensional version of this mixed anomaly, uh, but mm -hmm. do you have in mind what would be the theory that realized this type of anomaly? The BC ghosting, I mean, naively, the, well, just by the name, the holomorphic BC ghost needs two dimensionality for the final right. function. Right. Right. So, uh, we haven't thought about this very, we haven't thought about this, but. Um, Sorry, maybe, there's a natural generalization of the topological maybe twist. Maybe topological twist, yeah, yeah. I was, yes. yeah, I was going to say that. Um, Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could you, so, uh, your, your voice overlapped, so I couldn't hear. What was the answer? Uh, yeah, you can probably, uh, you, you can also consider higher dimensional topological twists. Uh-huh. And that should, that should realize this anomaly. I see. And uh, let me just point like out Donaldson that, theory. Uh, so let me just point out that this anomalous phase, so this lambda is the gauge parameter for an internal U1. Um, if you replace this lambda by the dilatation symmetry, the dil yeah, dilatation symmetry, then this is nothing, well, then th this, this, this becomes um, sort of the, the usual trace anomaly. So in, in any even dimension, uh, even space-time dimensions, the trace anomaly has a piece that is proportional to the, uh, to the Euler form. Mm -hmm. um, so this is sort of taking that and then just replacing dilatation by an internal U1. So um, yeah, that's just a comment. I see. Thank you. Sure. Uh, are you sure in that case, lambda has the required, uh, you know, um, reality condition for this to give you a phase? No, no, I, I sorry. I, yeah. Um, 
I thought the E coefficient has a different reality condition compared to the F. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I was just pointing out uh, a way to think about this anomaly, but uh, yeah, I'm not saying that it can be described by this formula precisely. Okay. I think you guys maybe so you section a single bit if there is no. And at the same time I have a homework for you guys. The homework is that try to fill in the question mark I left for you. There should be a music tones for the Taiwanese and try to work it out. It requires some good hearing as a good intellectual challenge. By the way, you can share, share back your screens. And any more questions from the, from the, for the for Yinxian? Well, if not, uh, let's thank Xin Xuan, and uh, you can stay around if you have more questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice talk.